making sure everyone's got a chance to look at the draft and have an opportunity to provide feedback and questions. Um, a little bit more of an understanding of some of the nuances around accommodation processes um, when staff are um, figuring out if they're going to be coming to work in person or not. Um, again, make sure everyone understands how to provide feedback and then also clarify what's coming next um, in terms of the reopening plan. Great. So can, um, can I interrupt you just for a second? I'm Please. so sorry. I had a Please. very good question from Ms. Wenzel um, and asked if this um, uh, meeting was going to be recorded and I went ahead and, and started recording. I hope that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely okay. And like I said, we'll also be collecting everything from the chat as well. Rosie, did you want to jump in? Yeah, actually, I wanted to plug that exact uh, point. Um, if, you, if I could get the transcript, like a download of all the chats, so that way I can make sure that whatever's in the chat is captured or followed up on somehow in our um, modifications and updated versions of the policy. All right, so moving on to the next uh, slide. So in the um, policy that you guys have in your hands, there's really four key elements. One is how employees are designated for return or non-return to learning. And then the accommodation process, the types of accommodations, the procedures for requests, the different kinds of um, leave, including temporary leave options, um, as well as a complaints and a dispute resolution process. I wanna make clear to everyone that um, this is not gonna be the kind of thing where you go in, you have a 20 minute meeting and everything is resolved either, um, you, know, uh, you know, in any direction. So this is an iterative process. Um, this is something where uh, employees who've been requested to return for in-person learning um, will have an opportunity to request accommodations. That will involve, um, uh, you know, several cycles. And then if the employee feels like, hey, this isn't being handled correctly, there's a whole dispute resolution process as well. And then the last part of it is, is links to the resources and forms that we think are going to be relevant for you um, um, through this process. So if you could go to the next slide. So uh, I want to um, just be clear that, you know, Whatever, whatever we do um, in terms of return to in-person learning, just to harken back to where we were um, a few weeks ago when we were discussing this, that ACE is planning, um, if we do return to in-person learning, that that would be done school by school. That is, each school community would look at its student data, look at its parent responses, and figure out um, if in-person learning is something that would be an important way for us to support students. And then we will be moving through this in phases. So um, the first phase, Fulong, uh, remind me what the maximum would be for the high school? Our high school maximum is 25 students in phase one. So in phase one, the high school, if, they, if the high school um, was to go through the process, uh, you know, seek permission to uh, bring up to 25 students on to campus um, to support them if they're really struggling, um, then we would designate the employees, um, the school leadership would designate the employees needed to serve those kids on campus. Please note that um, distance learning will continue to run um, for every student that requests it. And of course, if we have up to 25 kids in phase one, the vast majority of the students at the high school will continue to be in distance learning. So once that designation has happened from the school leadership, employees have an opportunity to self-designate into, yes, I'm ready to return, or no, I, I, I'm a high, I, I qualify for the high risk designation, or I'm not ready to return, but I don't qualify for an official high risk um, designation. And so that would be um, shared with HR and then, um, all the employees who are seeking accommodations will work through this iterative interactive process with both HR, which is led by Rosie, and your manager at the school. And again, at the end of the day, if the employee who's been asked to come for in-person um, uh, you know, is not satisfied or concerned with um, the process that's happening with, the, with HR and their manager, then, then, then that would be a dispute that I would need to resolve, okay? So 
Next slide, please. This is linked in the, in the document itself, but these are kind of a flow chart that shows from a very, very 50,000 foot level what the process is for um, accommodations. So um, you can see here that it kind of gives you a, a basic step-by-step -step process, but I do wanna caution everyone that um, this is, this looks, you know, kind of in some ways very uh, sequential, approved, not approved, you move to the next phase. Um, please remember that at all of these phases, there's gonna be multiple iterations and multiple discussions between you and HR and your manager. Moving on to the next. So you can see here, this is what the in-person learning one looks like. Again, this is just a piece of what you have linked in your document. Um, if you can go to the next one, Rosie. This is for people who um, meet the official designation of high risk and what high risk is, is also um, sort of detailed in the policy and, and is obviously something that we can provide more detail for you um, should you want to request this accommodation. Then next one, Rosie, please. And then for those of you who are not in the official high risk category, but do not feel ready to return to campus, um, there's a process here as well. There's also, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, there are people who may need to miss work um, because they're quarantined or have other um, effects due to COVID-19 personally, or they have a dependent um, who they are responsible for, and there will be um, processes for accommodations there as well. Keep going. So I just wanna, again, before we dig into the, um, policy itself. And I saw that there was a bunch of questions and we will definitely address all of those um, during this meeting. But the next steps are really to finalize this policy and um, uh, get all these questions collected with answers. But at the same time, you know, we have been working on our COVID positive plan, which includes our response to neighborhood trends. I saw um, their uh, um, some questions popped up on what happens with, you know, the county designation, thinking about neighborhood designation. We'll have all of our planning for how we're going to approach uh, testing, um, for what our approach is to contact tracing, what our approach is to, you know, quarantine and closure policies. All of those things will be laid out and shared with you, and we'll have a meeting like this one to go over those. We're also going to have a process that schools can go through should they want to move towards um, bringing students back for phase one in-person learning, the milestones that need to be hit, the timelines, meaning this has to be in place X number of weeks um, before opening, et cetera. And there'll also be a policy handbook. I mean, I, I um, in my interactions with staff, you know, questions have come up on everything from what happens if students don't, um, don't wear their masks? Or what happens if, you know, um, people are uh, going to be, um, you know, uh, in specific cohorts? How do we do our fixed cohorts versus, you know, how do we organize our, our campuses um, to, you know, minimize the possibility of, of transmission? All of those different kinds of things, whether it's um, what happens in the in the classroom, what happens outside of the school, um, those policies will be collected. And, and along with those policies is a handbook for training um, where um, before any kind of opening would happen, all students, staff, and families would go through a training protocol um, along with the, the, the ways that we would audit that. And then lastly, I think one thing that's gonna be really critical is how do we how do we set standards for how we communicate information? Obviously, when you're talking about medical information, there are uh, privacy issues that come up and there's going to be a, a certain kind of need to know basis when people potentially become ill. Um, but we need to be clear about what kinds of communication we're gonna share, not only with staff, but with the community as well. And once those are all in place, then a site can say, all right, are we ready um, do we think that given what our student data is telling us, 
whether it's attendance data or whether it's academic data or whether it's, you know, other feedback we're getting from families and students. Do we think bringing um, up to 25 students onto the high school campus is going to be an important way of proceeding? But we're really going to move forward on that once all of these steps are in place. So I did see a, a bunch of questions and we are definitely going to get to all of those. Um, but what I want to make sure of is that um, and, and please keep adding those questions as we go. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to really review the document and um, and then, you know, so there isn't a situation where, you know, some people haven't had a chance to dig in deeply and some people have. So I'm going to ask Mr. Andrade or I don't know if I should ask someone else. I don't see him there. Um, just in terms of your culture at the high school. How much time would you like to suggest people be given to really take a moment to dig deep into the document? And at the same time, Rosie or Vulong, would you please put the link to the document in the chat? Yeah, that was going to be my first suggestion is to put the link in the chat. And then um, I think we can start. Is it okay if we start with maybe 10 or 11 minutes and then see how people are doing from there? Sure. No, whatever you guys want. And then we'll have the rest of the time just to address the questions, both those on the chat and any that people want to bring up sort of live. Okay. So again, just to make sure we're all operating on sort of a level playing field, let's take 11 minutes. Um, it, Rosie, if you could throw the timer up on screen. Um, again, that was just a really quick overview to make sure we're all clear on sort of where we're going give everyone some time to, to dig into the document and then just start going bang, bang, bang through the questions and hopefully either providing immediate response or um, making sure we collect those questions and get back to you with the answers soon. All right, so I'll see you all in 11 minutes.
Hey, Greg, as we wind down, um, I just want to take a quick pulse and see uh, what people are thinking in terms of like, is this enough time? I did see in the chat one question about maybe um, going a little bit fast, maybe getting a clarification from, I don't know who asked that question, um, as to what kind of that means. And I just want to make sure that people are having enough time and space to read the document, understand it, and then, you know, uh, have questions. Yeah, so so my goal was just to give a very quick overview and then give as much time as people need to delve into the document. And now, you know, we've got the rest of the time to go through questions that have already surfaced. We're also going to be coming back um, with the follow up document. So this won't be the last meeting. So people can either bring up additional questions then or we'll be answering questions that get sent to us directly. Um, as we go forward. And hopefully, a lot of them will also be addressed in the FAQ document as well. Does that kind of, but, but again, um, you know, the amount of time people want to engage with um, the CMO team or with me directly on this, you know, happy to come back. Um, but we, we, we do plan to come back regardless with the other parts um, of the documentation that I listed on that slide before. So Ray, I don't know, you know how you want to re-engage, but what we would do right now is start responding to the questions in order. Um, is there anything else you want to do before we start that process? No, I'm good. I think uh, if we start doing that, I think that would be great. Um, just to uh, reiterate that these questions that are in the chat or any questions that come up, um, they're going to be uh, kind of addressed in the FAQ document. Is that my understanding? Yes. Okay. All right, so, you know, Rosie and Vulong, um, throwing the mic in your direction, um, and then let me know if there's anything you want me to address. Sure, so just to be clear, we're not gonna give any more reading time. We're just gonna oh. get into the question. Just wanted to be clear about that. Ray, is that okay if we jump into the questions? Uh, does anybody on the call have, uh, or maybe if the majority of, of people on the call say that that, that was enough time, that would, that would be okay. So if I can get a quick thumbs up. Yeah, that was enough time. Let's go ahead with the questions. I'm seeing thumbs up. Cool. All right. Okay. Okay. So I'm oh. going to go I'm going to go ahead and then um, go back to the presentation. There are two slides, short slides on F on the first set of FAQs that we were able to include into this presentation. Um, I really appreciate all your uh, participation and questions that you of uh, all the information and questions you guys have, have added in the chat so that's very helpful to us we I really appreciate it so let me just go back to the presentation real quick and then we'll get through then we'll go through some of the questions in the chat let me get rid of this let's go back to here present and just real quick um so one of the questions that came up in one of our earlier presentations was how, um, what category does living with someone who is high risk fall? Where do we, where do you fall as an employee? So that would mean that you would not be ready to return to on campus, but you're not high risk because you are, we are looking to find out, identify if you're high risk. So if a housemate, a family member that you live with um, is high risk, then it would be that category that you would follow that, that path. The next question is what document or documents will be, will need to be submitted for high risk employees. So there's a med medical certification process that we will undergo. So we will request information from you and your doctor. Um, in the medical certification process, we don't need to find out a diagnosis, but we do need to find out what accommodations and what um, supports you will need to be able to succeed in achieving your um, work assignment. Is telework still available as an accommodation? Yes, it will still be available. Um, public health is still requesting that we, as much as practicable, allow for people to work from remote. So that is still a recommendation that we will be, um, an accommodation that we will be providing. 
And in general, if you're not required to come onto campus, then we are requesting people to work from home as much as possible. The next one is more about reopening. What is the plan for reopening? And that's a very big general question, but in the upcoming meetings, you'll get um, more information regarding what student cohorts look like, student movement looks like, um, along with uh, all the different requirements for students um, wearing, like wearing face covers or masks, distance, um, distancing in and out of the campus. So basically student movement on campus. When are A schools reopening? So we've stated um, that we will work towards attempting to open uh, by January 20th, with those small cohorts, but there's no guarantee that we will open by the 20th. It's really about just the campus readiness. So we're gonna be, that's, our, that's kind of our, our, our date where we're trying to backwards plan from. So this is definitely dependent on school readiness. And then when will the teachers and actually staff know when they return? So based on the phased reopening plan, we are anticipating to notify those, those, those small groups of teachers and staff when, to, when they'll be returning no, no later than two weeks, but around four weeks prior to the reopening so we can make sure that we are training them and providing them all the resources they need to come back. So let me stop sharing that screen and then let's go back to the chat. So Vulong, um, you there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can start answering. Again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for your questions. And I'm just gonna go over these questions one at a time. Um, so how are we still talking about reopening if the county is at purple? I think that's two questions. And another one by Mr. Santos asked, does San Jose being moved to purple zone affect the reopening process? And the answer is yes, it does. Uh, we are gonna review that at, when we go over the COVID positive plan, which talks about school closure. Uh, and so definitely um, the tiers, infection rates of the county, state, and neighborhood district impact reopening. So we're not gonna go over it right now, but uh, those different infection rates and those different tiers are discussed when we review the COVID positive plan. So yes, it definitely does impact. Um, what schools are doing outside of ACE influence ACE decision to return back to campus? Uh, what schools, um, what, oh, the question is what are other schools doing? Um, not really. I think our more concern is uh, what are our students needs are and what our families' um, needs uh, are, are asking for. So that really influences our decisions and then obviously uh, the safety and the willingness of the staff. Uh, those are the main influencing factors, not so much other schools. Do teachers have a say in choosing the 25 students? Yes, they do. So I'll be part of your school leadership team with your teachers uh, to determine who are those highest needs students. Again, the phasing approach is all about um, you know, supporting the, the highest need students. I'm sure uh, you teachers know who they are. I know Ray and I met uh, last Friday, we reviewed uh, your quarter one data on grades and attendance. And uh, we can, I'm um, sure we know the same students who are, uh, you know, uh, having some struggles in distance learning, who aren't being engaged much in your classes, who aren't doing uh, or even attending your classes. Uh, those are the, the 25 most highest need students that we want to come back, but definitely the, the staff uh, with Ray uh, leading it will, will determine who those uh, 25 students will be. Uh, are you going to go over the process in more detail? Yeah, because we're going pretty fast. Uh, yes, Mr. Carey, um, there will be additional meetings uh, on, on, this, uh, on the process, on multiple questions. So uh, there'll be multiple attempts to make sure uh, questions are heard and entire processes are fully understood. Is there a workflow for extended bereavement? Uh, Rosie, can you answer this question? So a workflow like what we diagrammed out in this presentation? Um, no, but we do have work, uh, bereavement covered in the handbook. Um, depending on who the person is to you, it determines how many days you're um, um, entitled to for bereavement. But if there is an extended need, then of course we would go through the accommodation process and leave of absence process. So you would te technically could fall under um, one of those categories. And of course it's gonna be an interactive process to determine what's the appropriate amount of time. Uh, Mr. Aguilar asks, um, 
is there are, are there going to be more conversations on reopening? Yes, there will, Ms. Aguilar. Just today, we're just going over the return to in-person learning policy for staff. Uh, as Mr. Uh, Lipman said earlier, after Thanksgiving break, we will go over the COVID positive plan, as well as the detailed um, return to campus handbook training. Uh, those those are happening uh, multiple times. So I predict at least two more meetings with, with the staff, uh, if not even more. But those are at least two that we've already um, have mapped out. And this is going to happen uh, after the Thanksgiving break. Uh, do students and families have choice uh, yes, uh, yes, they do. So distance learning will always be available for our students and families, uh, even if they have a medical note or diagnosis or not. Uh, you know, any family and student that chooses to sustain distance learning will definitely have that opportunity. Um, we're, we're, the phasing approach is more for the, the, the students who are showing that distance learning isn't going well for them. And, you know, there have been uh, families and even students have contacted us that want to be back on campus because that's better for them. So this is more for those students. Um, but yes, uh, there will always be options of distance learning for all students. What does temporary leave due to COVID mean? Um, continue teaching during distance learning. Uh, so it uh, doesn't necessarily mean continue teaching during distance learning. Like if you're on leave, uh, because you're sick or, or something, you're, that means you're totally off work, right? Like you're, you don't have to do any any work, anything. Uh, so that it means you're totally disconnected. I think that's what the question is asking. So we're not going to ask you to continue work when you're on leave. Anything you want to clarify on that, Rosie? No, that's about right. So if someone is on leave and is unable to work from home, then that's an accommodation we need to consider. Um, and yeah, you were basically, not, you're on leave. You're not working for your ACE temporarily. You're recovering. You're making yourself healthy or making your family healthy. So that's your priority. Okay. Um, the next question is, if staff become positive or has to quarantine because they contract it at work, do they have to use sick pay or vacation days? Um, there's a flow chart. Rosie, you want to talk about this? Yeah. So the, one of the last, um, flow charts is basically the, the protections and the federal and state um, protections that are afforded to people that have to take time off for COVID related cases. So there are different buckets of sick time that, um, you can use. Um, some of those protections are set to expire December 31st, but we are already hearing word that they are going to get extended or they should be getting extended. Um, because we are getting into a, a time of year where people are seeing a spike in infections, right? So those are a different bucket. Um, and then we would work with you to fi find out what's the best uh, way to allocate those buckets. Should staff salary or alley expect hazard pay? So at this stage, we are not including hazard pay uh, for in-person work, in-person learning work. Uh, what measures are in place if a significant staff are high risk or unable to return to work? Uh, yes, Mr. Lucero. So one of the things we actually already pre-built into our staffing this year, uh, I'm sure returning staff noticed this, is that the amount of staff on campus is much greater uh, than what we have normally uh, because we pre-built in um, knowing that maybe multiple staff members can't return to work. So that's already pre-built into your staffing model. You have m many more teachers than you, you would normally have uh, for this very reason. Uh, but then also on top of that, uh, again, through the process of, of leave, we can start uh, you know, pinpointing additional subs or additional members to be brought on campus if there is a significant. And then in the end, uh, if, if there's just too many staff uh, because they're, they can't, Come back, you know. I think Greg will will call it a, a day and, and probably um, put the school back in distance learning if we don't have the, the proper staffing. So there's multiple means that we are uh, setting in place to make sure the proper staffing is in place. Can I just add to that, Vulong? Yeah. Go ahead, um, go ahead. The the whole point of distance learning would be, I'm sorry, of in person learning would be that we think it's going to be more effective than the distance learning for a subgroup of kids. And so if for whatever reason, whether it, you know, we do our audits, we go on campus and either staff or students aren't following the protocols or perhaps to use this example, there's not enough staff who are able to be on campus, then, then we're not gonna do it. I mean, the, the whole point is to, um, you know, take responsibility for, for those kids who are bombing out and, um, in-person learning exists not to check a box and say, oh, we got to in-person learning, but 
as a targeted response for the kids who are who are failing. So just to amplify what Vulong saying, if there's not enough staff who are available to do in person to do it well, we won't do it. Uh, the next question is how how much notice will staff get before being notified? Uh, as Rosie mentioned earlier, um, two to four weeks they will be notified um, if they are asked to come in. Are we receiving or have received the return to campus train? Uh, no, you, you haven't received it yet, uh, Mr. Lucero. You will receive this after the Thanksgiving holidays. Uh, so that's one of the next meeting. The next meeting really is to go over this uh, return to campus training handbook and the COVID positive plan. That's actually what the next meeting is going to be about, re reviewing those two documents. So you should receive again after the Thanksgiving holiday. If and when reopening has a date, will there be another meeting? Yes, uh, yes, Ms. Tan, there are, like I said, there are, I predict at least two more meetings, not just one. Uh, the document says instruction given by ACE in regards to isolation and quarantine. Where is ACE getting information on best practices for isolation and quarantine? Uh, Rosie, can you answer that? Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple of us at the central office that have been attending the county designee training. And every single bit of guidance and next steps and documentation that we send out like notices will be the ones used from the county public health department. So we're not independently deciding, oh, I think you're just going to take seven days and you're going to take five days. So no, we're, we're under orders to follow those instructions. So all those templates that they've sent us are basically been modified to be more ACE related, but we're following their guidance completely. The next question is, what is the time frame for return to campus training? What is the time frame from training to when we expect it to return? Uh, so again, we, we notify staff two to four weeks prior. Training will happen one to two weeks prior to reopening. The document says employees will allow all safety mandate mandates, for example, wearing face coverings, proper hand washing, sanitizing, social distancing guidelines. What happens when employees are not following all safety mandates? Uh, yeah, so uh, Olivia, uh, the same thing that we would ha uh, deal with staff who don't follow other uh, employee-related, uh, um, you know, requests as to being an ACE employee, which is going through the, um, you know, program improvement process, you know, formal warning letters. So it's, it'll be the same type of process. Um, and uh, of anything you want to add to that, Rosie? Yeah, so basically we would go through the process of a progressive discipline for any employee that doesn't adhere to ACE policies or processes. Uh, the next question says, um, paid leave provisions are effective April 1st, 20, and then leave taken between April 21st, 2020 and December 31st, 2020. What happens after December? Oh yeah, so, um, Will there be no more paid leave? So, uh, so right now, Olivia, there, there is no more uh, paid leave uh, from the federal government. But as Rosie had mentioned, um, uh, we predict the, the new administration will extend this after December 1st, 2020. Uh, but as of right now, there, you know, there's nothing legally set in place from the government. Is it possible to bring back teachers back before students? I am imagining that special ed will be the first group of teachers back and three out of four of our learning specialists are new to the school. So I would appreciate having a few days getting used to campus and new protocols without students so we can have the leader, can be the leader for our students. Uh, yes, Ms. Wartz, um, part of the training uh, is, you know, around one to two weeks before students come back. So you definitely, we will do a in-person training, walking staff, how they are to return to campus, step-by-step, -step, how they enter campus, how they are to act on campus, you know, during breaks, during lunch, restroom, how they uh, are to work with students, how are they to even exit campus. Uh, so all those things will happen in the training uh, one to two weeks before uh, students are on campus. So yeah, we, we don't wanna make it live that you do both at the same time with students. And the same thing for students, just so that everyone know, we were asking the same thing of students that they need to come in one to two weeks before uh, they are with teachers and going through the same training uh, with, with them and their families on how they are to act on campus. I could take Erica's question about sure. leave and medical benefits. So if a person is to go on leave, we would work with the employee to, to figure out how to but, um, uh, collect uh, benefits, pie-ups or benefits extensions beyond yourself. So we would work with you to determine how that would work. So. 
the, the next question is if you are an intern and the university prohibits the intern being on campus, how would that be addressed? So that you would just have to connect with our HR team and go through the accommodation process. Are counselors included interns required to be on campus? Uh, so I'll um, answer that first question. So um, the the school leadership team uh, and the staff, you know, after selecting the 25 students, will determine the the necessary staff to support those students. So if it, you know if it is a uh, of all 25 students are, are students that have counseling needs, then it, it may be that the counselors should be back. But again, that's that's something your 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 school leadership team will determine. So that's not something we are are mandating that has to be. Uh, students that have counseling. So that's something if you feel based off your your highest needs students, you, you determine who they are, then you determine which staff would be best to support them. The next question is, can telework still be possible due to risk level? Uh, yes, so as Rosie had mentioned earlier, telework can still be an accommodation uh, for staff. How many people can be in one classroom at a time, including uh, special ed staff? Rosie, do you remember the number? I think it's yeah, I can't so remember. students by themselves is twelve, and I think depending on the on the students' needs, it, it, I would say no. More. I think it, the literature says two adults per twelve students. Um, yeah. So that's, but, yeah. But those those exact numbers and um, what the stable cohorts look like and what the rotating staff cohort that's gonna all be all in the in person training manual uh, when we come back from break. Is failing grades the only factor being considered for selecting 25 students? Uh, no, no, that's not the only factor. I think that's one factor. Uh, I think another factor that uh, Ray and I had already looked at, but again, that'll be your site to determine, was uh, engagement and attendance rates, right? There are just a lot of students who are not engaging, um, coming to class or having contact. Uh, and then there's another portion that uh, Lucas, our director of student services has advocated for, is just, you know, uh, targeting uh, students who have maybe a uh, high uh, mental health risks uh, that are showing signs that they might might need some more in-person contact of staff. So again, all, all three of those factors are being uh, being factored in and that will be determined by by Ray and your, your school site. We have staff, will staff have the opportunity to give input before we finalize this? Yes, so I would uh, say yes, you would definitely connect with Ray and your leadership team on who are those 25 students. And I believe those are all the questions in the comments. I would like to open up to any other questions anyone has had since, um, you know, that they, they want to ask right now. Vulong, I just want to add a quick comment, if I could. Um, yeah. it, it very well may be, if you're anything like me, that there are some questions you have about this that are not really, you know, best suited to share in front of 43 of your colleagues. Um, really, really encourage you to reach out individually, um, either setting up a time for a phone conversation or, um, um, you know, an answering over email. Um, again, I think there's a lot um, of questions here that are that you know can apply to very personal situations with your family, with your own health, etc. So uh, please do not feel like when we you know get off of this Zoom call that that the question and answer period is over. Um, I also want to say thank you to those of you on this call who have taken the time to reach out to me directly with your concerns and your feedback, as well as those of you who have come to the community task force meetings, as well as coming to speak at ACE board meetings. Just do wanna share on, on, on behalf of the ACE board members um, that they very much appreciate you taking the time to speak to them directly. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Maybe that's obvious, but wanted to reiterate that before the, the meeting closed. Thanks Greg, there's, there's a couple more questions just popped up. Um, so will the recording be available to staff? Uh, I would connect with uh, Ray um, you're, you're recording this, right, Ray? Yes, and yeah. uh, what I typically do is add it to, um, download it onto the YouTube channel, and then I will share the link with the staff as soon as 
this uh, video is converted. Yeah. Uh, and then the next question will students be asked to go through COVID training, uh, hand washing, social distancing, wearing masks? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the same type of training that we have for staff one to two weeks prior to opening, we will do the same thing for students, again, in small, uh, in their cohorts, uh, stable cohorts, to make sure they are aware of how they are to come back to campus. Have we already talked about what in-person learning is going to look like? Um, so we have in previous meetings with the task force, but I, I'll go over it briefly, Mr. Carey. Um, so we're doing in-person learning in a phased approach, phase one, phase two, phase three. And it's not a hybrid model. It's basically distance learning will continue as normal. However, you know, 25 of your highest need students in phase one will be asked uh, or we recommend it to come back for in-person learning. And essentially all they're doing is distance learning while on campus with another adult uh, in the room or on, you know, near them that in the event they have a question instead of getting frustrated in the past and just shutting their computer down and not doing any work, this time they might, you know, ask, you know, Mr. Ray, I, I can't find this document. I don't know what Ms. Tan's talking about or I can't find the, the math problems, et cetera. But, you know, they just have an adult there. But otherwise they're, they're basically doing distance learning while on campus. Uh, phase one, that's what phase one is about, your highest needs students. And then phase two, is still the same thing, uh, it's just with more students, up to 50 students. So we just expand it to include more students once we feel uh, the safety measures are working, that the phase one students are, are learning and improving from where they're at, then we just want to expand and include more students um, because I'm sure uh, once Ray shares with you the, the quarter one data results, there's more than 25 students that have needs right now. Then um, phase two, again, phase two is the same thing, it just expands to more, more students um, each, each phase. Uh, but at this stage, uh, Mr. Carey, we are not, uh, have, haven't even thought about any type of hybrid model where, you know, distance learning, as we know, it ceased to continue. Uh, right now, it's just continued distance learning with small group uh, supports. Uh, I would also love to have future conversations address how teachers on campus are going to be doing both in-person and supporting distance learning. Uh, yeah, so that's something that's very specific to your site. Uh, every site is a little bit different, but that's something you would work with your leadership team on making sure the scheduling works out. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we, we had hired additional staffing this year for this very uh, purpose and this very reasoning so that we can have rotating shifts so that uh, students can be supporting and staff can be on distance learning platforms at the same time. But that's, again, specific to your site that Ray and your leadership team will, will hash out with, with your teachers before coming back to campus. Are students returning to school if we remain in purple phase? Uh, so that's gonna be part of the COVID positive plan. Uh, and it you know, talks about the state, county, and neighborhood infection rates. Uh, and you know, we're not gonna discuss that right now, but that come in, comes up right after the Thanksgiving break on you know, when do schools continue to stay closed or, or when do they open up? So distance learning in person. Yes, yes, Mr. Carey. They basically just go on the campus with their Chromebooks, sit in a corner of the room that's you know, designated for them, and they do that distance learning uh, while on campus. A lot of students have partners within the school. I imagine that distancing won't be happening between students. I urge A's to think about how to address that. So I don't need to need, so I don't need an answer now. Uh, yes, Erica, uh, that's part of our you know, how do you deal with student engagement um, during the phase approach? So we actually have a little section on that in the training manual, um, you know, how we do it. You know, that's part of the distance, but also like, you know, wearing masks, proper hands, you know, uh, proper washing of hands, all the different safety measures that students uh, should be doing and staff. Mm. Uh, I also wonder if there will be a process if we find out a student is going to family and traveling and other things that means they are increasing their risk of COVID. Uh, yeah, that, that'll be part of the process. Um, I have connected with other sites who have opened up and asked them how they are handling this. So a lot of this comes from just uh, state and county uh, guidelines on what the, the school has to do and dictated by the, the state, uh, the health department, the county health department. So that, that'll be part of you know, what happens when that happens. And eventually, 
uh, what Greg had mentioned earlier that in the event that this isn't going to work out, either one or two things would happen is that uh, the student and family won't be allowed to come back for in person learning because they, um, you know, but continue to violate these safety measures or that the whole school might might go back on school closure and distance learning if it's it's rampant and that it's not safe for everyone. A lot of the kids are traveling for upcoming breaks. Yes, so that is one of the reasons why we decided to push it way out till January 20th so that during the holiday um, breaks, traveling is happening and we're not you know opening up right afterwards so that people come back to campus. So there's a reason why it is pushed out a little further out. I imagine that student cohorts will remain with the same teacher. How will teachers be supporting in the classroom with their work, finding documents, answering questions from other classes while teaching? Uh, yeah, so the student, um, the student cohorts will be in cohorts. The teachers um, aren't gonna be in cohorts. So there may be a rotation of, the, like Rosie said earlier, two teachers. So there will be a schedule. Again, this will be something uh, your leadership team will figure out of the two teachers so that uh, you can still work with other students on camp online, but also uh, the students who are on campus get support from the teachers. Again, this is detail specific at your school site that your leadership team will hash out. Yes. Long, I'm going to jump in. It's it's um, a little bit after 10 o'clock, Ray. I don't know how um, strict you want to be with the time. Um, I unfortunately have to um, head off to another meeting, but I do want to really um, encourage people um, to reach out to me directly with any questions or concerns they might have. If you'd like to communicate over email, you'd like to hop on the phone, um, you know, um, but uh, if you're looking for you know, more technical questions to get answered that involve a little more expertise, those would be the ones to direct to the HR email or to call the central office directly. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you, and I really hope you do um, share with us all the questions that you have. It really helps us improve the quality and the comprehensiveness of our documents. So I'm sorry I have to jump off, um, but it was good to see all of you and, and uh, you know, wanna wish you all a, a really happy early Thanksgiving and I look forward to reconnecting uh, the week we get back. So uh, thanks everyone, talk to you soon. Hi Greg, I also have to jump off, but I can wait for about five more minutes if anybody wants has any other questions. Yeah, I can say if there's more questions, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, and just let me say uh, thank you to CMO. Um, one of the things that has come kind of uh, become, and I, I appreciate, I appreciate this idea of schools being right, so, um, what, uh, we feel is going to be an appropriate response that school, that our school is going to be the one that makes the decision um, of readiness. And, and that's going to be after uh, it, we're not, we're not, I want to reiterate, and I hope I'm doing this okay, is that January 20th is not a day we're coming back. Um, January 20th is the day that we sort of put in place a saying that nothing is going to happen prior to January 20th. Am I okay saying that, Wulong? Yeah, uh, nothing can't happen before January 20th. Right. And so um, just to let everybody know, and we're going to reiterate this over and over again, um, as we work to reach milestones of compliance according to our work with CMO, we will be doing making all of these decisions as a group. And like we've mentioned before, uh, in terms of collective efficacy, we are gonna work um, better and move faster or more efficiently if we do it together. And so um, one of the things that I wanna just emphasize is that these uh, forums here are, are our opportunity to make sure that questions are answered and that um, that we get as much information so that we can, you know, service our families the way um, they deserve to be serviced. And so in my mind, it's always about a student first mentality. And I, uh, I know that that's the same case with, um, with everyone else. And so uh, everybody on the call. And so, um, yeah. I just want to appreciate uh, CMO for that partnership, um, but also that sort of, um, you know, trust that we're going to do what's right for our families. 
um, and that this is a collaborative effort. It's not something that is going to be, uh, you know, forced on anybody ever. And with that, if anybody has any other questions, we'll take them. If not, uh, we'll get ready for college sem and community today. Uh, Erica just asked a question. Rosie, can you can you read that about legal action taken? At this point, I don't, there wouldn't be any, I, I wouldn't know how, I, it's, I don't believe there's an easy way to determine how you got COVID because it's what they consider um, community spread. So legal act, can legal action be taken? Um, I, that's, that's a hard answer to, that's just a hard answer to give you because of the nature of the uh, just the nature of COVID so um, I think I would need to know more about the situation to kind of say like for example I think if you're saying something like the ice cream shop thing where uh, a teacher coughed in a kid's face I don't know if you guys saw that on social media or in the news but if, if there are situations like that I think it would be something to that there could be some sort of disciplinary action taken if people are, but I, it's, it's just hard to say, depending on the situation. Everything's case by case, so. Well, we have an opportunity, Ms. Andrade, to debrief as a staff for a moment, just us. Certainly, if um, I can leave the call open um, and kick CMO off the call and then, uh, we, we, we can debrief as a staff. Um, with everybody's permission, I'll keep the recording going and uh, just so that we can all have, or we can turn off the recording, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just to have that, this piece, uh, you know, saved for everybody, and then we can talk while it's being uploaded. Okay, okay so then with that, um, I just want to echo what Greg said. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or if you'd rather go through the HR email, which again, is completely confidential, please do that also. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, high school team. Thanks, everyone. Thank See you later. You and Mr. Andrade, can you make sure that you send, share the, the part that is recorded? Yes, I will, me? of course. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take I'm care. I'm going to send you the direct uh, YouTube link. Beautiful. Thanks. And you Take can care. subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's a joke, Rosie. I do that from time to time. I know you do. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Felicia. I'm kidding. That's a joke, too. That was recorded. <laughs> I'm stopping the recording now.